breaking the wall of the hidden universe. How particle physics can explain the nature of matter. Rolf Dieter Hoyer, CERN. On November 9th, I was overwhelmed. So 20 years ago, I'm not sure where I really was on the 9th of November, but I know I was somewhere in France, I would guess 100 meters below ground, enabling an experiment which at that time started, so I could only watch the fall of the wall from the far, but it was nonetheless exciting and very nice, especially nice for a German. So, breaking the wall of the hidden universe, at CERN, not at Berlin. Before I do that, let me spend one minute on CERN to rectify a little bit the view of CERN maybe. It's not angels and demons. It is not like the Big Bang here. It's about the Big Bang. But it's also about people and about breaking walls. And let me remind you that CERN was created, was founded 55 years ago out of a movement which was called Atoms for Peace. And I think CERN is meanwhile a model organization which really brings together people. We are really breaking the walls between cultures and nations since 1954. And this gives you, only look on the colors, the distribution of all CERN users by nationality, member states, observer states, and other states. And you see, we have around 10,000 scientific users out of 97 nationalities. So we have more than half the uh, uh, United Nations on our campus. That's one thing. We were breaking another wall 20 years ago. Who of you is not using the internet? One. Oh, okay. Such people are existing. <laughs> Anyhow, it is 20 years ago that the web, the World Wide Web was born at CERN. Because we needed to have a reliable platform for communication and for information exchange. So we were also breaking the wall of communication. Okay, but let's now break the wall to the hidden universe. And this is the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to today. The universe expanded over roughly 14 billion years from essentially point-like to now 10 to the 28 centimeters. Don't ask me what 10 to the 28 centimeters are. I cannot imagine. It's just a number, but that's the size of the universe. And during that time, it cooled rapidly down to 2.7 Kelvin today in the background, micro, microwave background. This is from the Big Bang, 10 to the minus 32 point like to today, 10 to the 28, the development of the universe, 60 orders of magnitude. Again, very difficult to imagine. And how to learn about the universe? Well, we have astro astronomy and astrophysics, with space-based telescopes or ground-based telescopes which look into the universe and by looking into the universe you can see the history of the universe and the development of the universe. Particle physics is using powerful accelerators and studies the physics laws of microcosm and at the same time of the early universe. And you see we are coming pretty, pretty close, four orders of magnitude below the proton diameter we are coming pretty close to the Big Bang. And in the past decades, we have got a detailed understanding of the microcosm and of the visible universe. We have developed the standard model of particle physics with a missing cornerstone, the Higgs boson. That means, that's a question, what gives mass to particles? Because this standard model, the mathematical formalism, works only for massless particles. And therefore, Mr. Higgs has introduced a very nice formalism, and we have to find the boson, the Higgs boson, to get him his Nobel Prize. But this 
standard model has a big, big other problem. It only explains roughly 5% of the matter and energy density of the universe. 95% of the universe are dark. One quarter is dark matter, which clumps like normal matter, but interacts very little with normal matter. And three quarters are dark energy, which drives the universe apart. We don't know what dark matter is, and we know much, much less even about dark energy. But we know that there is dark matter, because this is from the Hubble Space Telescope, the galaxy cluster Hubble 370, and you see sometimes very strange pictures here. And if I zoom in here, you see there are multiple images of the same distant galaxies. Here are two, here are even three. That looks like a snake. So this is gravitational lensing through normal and through dark matter. The question is, what is this dark matter? Well, astronomy and astrophysics over the next two decades, maybe, will use more powerful new telescopes and they will tell us how dark matter has shaped, together with normal matter, the stars and the sky we see during the night sky, and the stars and the galaxies which we see in the night sky. But only particle accelerators can produce this dark matter in the laboratory and can understand exactly what it is. So, is it composed only of one kind of particle or is it more rich and more varied as the visible world? We don't know. But the favorite candidate for dark matter is supersymmetry. So to each, for each particle which exists, a supersymmetric part, partner of opposite statistics is introduced. So we double the number of particles. Now you will say, okay, if the physicists don't know what to do, they double the number of particles, they double the number of parameters, and that explains everything. But don't forget, around 80 years ago, Paul Dirac was brave enough to introduce the concept of antimatter. And with the concept of antimatter, he doubled the number of particles. And we gained a tremendous amount of knowledge, and today even we use it in the hospitals, in the positron emission tomography. Okay, so far, so much to doubling the particles. Okay, the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable in most models and therefore a fantastic candidate for, for dark matter, and the Large Hadron Collider covers a large range of masses of such hypothetical particles. It may be, therefore, the perfect machine to study dark matter, and it is the ideal machine for finding the Higgs boson, because if it exists, we will find it there. But we concentrate on the dark matter. The Large Hadron Collider is a unique machine in the, here, in the fantastic surroundings of Geneva, 100 meter underground. It gets us closest to the Big Bang, roughly 10 to the minus 13 seconds. It breaks the wall of light, because with light, with light telescopes, you only get to 300,000 years close to the Big Bang. Because only then atoms could be formed and light could get out of the universe, out of the, uh, yeah, at that time, universe. And it breaks the wall of neutrinos, because with neutrino telescopes, you only come up to one second close to the Big Bang. We come to 10 to the minus 13 seconds, very, very close. And we do, how do we do that? Well, we take protons, hydrogen uh, nuclei, run it in one direction, protons running in the other direction with 7 TeV on 7 TeV, 14 TeV, and that will bring us very close to the Big Bang. Now, the startup of the Large Hadron Collider is, to my mind, one of the most exciting turning points in particle physics. And as I just said, we explore a new energy frontier, Proton-proton collisions at the center of mass energy of 14 TeV. And this 14 million times per second. Now who knows what, what 14, TV, 14 TeV means? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you have to know. Okay, 7 TeV on 7 TeV. This is the stored energy in the beam is like 120 120 elephants running on 120 elephants with a full escape speed altogether. That's a huge energy. <coughs> Not enough for the Big Bang. And if one proton hits another proton, that's like a mosquito hitting a mosquito. 
How do I get to the Big Bang? It is hitting, a mosquito is hitting the mosquito on a tiny, tiny area, 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. Point-like. It's the energy density which does it in that collision. And that brings us close to the Big Bang, close to the early universe in one of the collisions. We have four big experiments at the four collision points, two omnipurpose experiments. One experiment which is special because it studies the question, why are we here? After all, at the beginning of the universe, matter and antimatter were created in equal quantities. That means we would all be energy. That would be good, seeing the first talk and the next talks. But shortly after the Big Bang, the, the started a small asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And this one part in 10 billion asymmetry, that's us. But how that came and why, this is this experiment which we study it. Okay, I have to hurry up. The LHC is the most empty place in the solar system because in order to run the particles through the LHC, a vacuum is needed which is below that, the, the pressure on the surface of the moon. I think it's roughly a factor of 10 lower than on the moon. It is one of the coldest places in the universe because the magnets are run at a temperature of 1.9 Kelvin above absolute zero. It's colder than outer space and it's 27 kilometers cold. It is one of the hottest places in the galaxy because the collision of the two proton beams generates temperature densities of 100 million times larger than those at the center of the sun, but in this much more confined space. It is equipped with the largest and most complex detectors. And just to give you an idea about the size of the detector here, this is the size of an average technician. So these are huge experiments, but they measure the particles with a fantastic accuracy, with a diameter all over the place, roughly with the diameter of the human hair. So fantastic engineering. So how can we see these supersymmetric particles which form maybe 25% of our universe? Well, we can create them and then they decay. And they decay in other supersymmetric particles plus normal particles and so on until they reach the lightest supersymmetric particle which has no more partner to decay to. And that is possibly dark matter. So with the LHC at the Terra scale, at the TV energy, we are now entering the dark world. So past decades saw precision studies of less than 5% of our universe. It was the discovery of the standard model. The LHC will soon deliver data. And we are just at the beginning of exploring 95% of our universe. The future is bright in the dark universe. Thank you.